This webinar marks the launch of the final report of our tech task force. Digitalisation and the need to address climate change are both rapidly reshaping the UK economy and, and the operating environment for businesses. The Tech Task Force brought together business representatives and innovation experts two years ago to explore the overlaps between these two agendas and how best to exploit any synergies. Since then, of course, we've had the arrival of another major and highly unwelcome uh, factor reshaping our lives. The current pandemic has only heightened the need to capitalise on new technologies in a way that can future-proof the economy. With the support of the task force, Green Alliance conducted a series of deep dives into different sectors to explore the opportunities to align digital adoption and green growth. These looked at transport, from more streamlined automotive manufacture to new business models like car clubs, at business energy efficiency, including the value of improved data collection, at how better design, data and modelling can reduce the impacts of the construction sector, and at digital technologies' potential to address food waste. This new report is an attempt to make sense of all of that, pulling out some common lessons and putting forward recommendations for policymakers. In a minute, our head of climate, Katerina Brandmeier, who led the work for the Tech Task Force, will talk you through the report. After that, we'll have an opening address from the Minister for Business, Energy and Clean Growth, the Right Honourable Kwadi Kwateng. Thank you very much, Minister, for joining us. And then a panel discussion with our expert speakers, Cathy Peach from Nesta and Albert Chung from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. There'll be an opportunity for audience questions at the end, so please put anything you'd like to ask in the Q&A box. Greenlight is Head of Resources, the VP is keeping an eye on what's being submitted. We'll turn to her later. If you have any other comments you'd like to make, please put them in the chat box. I'll hand over now to Katerina. Thank you, Rose, and thank you all for joining us today. It, we are delighted to be launching the Tech Task Force final report. The economic recovery from the impact of coronavirus is an opportunity to create a more prosperous and resilient economy. And this means gearing up businesses and communities for the new reality that will shape the future. In this report, we argue that it's by joining action on climate and digitalization that the UK can realize the full potential of new technologies to accelerate the transition to a green economy and ensure that UK businesses are best placed to compete internationally. Over the course of its two-year exploration, the Tech Task Force has identified numerous opportunities for digital technology to benefit the environment. Digital solutions can help speed up the deployment of clean technologies, for example, through smart charging to support integration of electric vehicles in the energy system, or through advanced manufacturing techniques that can enable the retrofit of inefficient buildings in a single step. Digital technology can also support the public in making more sustainable choices, for example, through smart mobility apps that can incentivize the use of public transport in place of public private cars. And digital can also help industry to make more effective use of resources, for example, by providing greater insight into the use of energy and materials and supporting better maintenance of equipment. These solutions will not only accelerate the transition to net zero, but will also benefit businesses in terms of improving their performance, helping them save costs and developing innovative products and business models. And with other nations setting out plans to boost low carbon industries and digitalization, Driving adoption in the UK will help businesses compete better in global markets. Crucially, the UK is well placed to lead on this agenda, building on its thriving tech scene and on the ongoing digitalization initiatives, and having the necessary legislative and institutional frameworks that can set the direction of travel towards a green economy, including the Committee on Climate Change, the legally binding net zero target, and the forthcoming Environment Act. However, the uptake of the digital low carbon solution has so far been limited, in part because of what has so far been a disjointed approach to digitalization and net zero. For example, some of the leading initiatives in to increase digital adoption, such as Made Smarter or the construction sector deal, have not realized the full potential of applications that can benefit the environment, given that they did not explicitly target low carbon solutions or did not focus as much on areas of high environmental impact. On the other hand, there has also been underinvestment in the data and digital systems that are needed to support green industries. For example, there's still limited data on material, for material flows through the economy, despite the fact that digital could support better tracking and more granular information on the way that we use resources and promote, therefore, innovation in resource efficient products and business models. And there are also examples of policies that still rely on outdated systems. For example, building energy efficiency ratings that rely on models as opposed to actual energy performance, which therefore limit the adoption of digital applications. With businesses needing all the help they can get 
to recover from COVID-19. It's vital that the UK's economic recovery addresses net zero and digitalization as linked priorities in order to put businesses on the best footing to compete internationally and support the jobs of the future. To achieve this, our report sets out five main recommendations. First of all, the government should join up the digital and low carbon agendas in its forthcoming strategies. With a national infrastructure strategy, potentially an updated industrial strategy, and various strategies relevant for digitalization and decarbonization expected in the autumn, this is a unique moment to make cohesive policy, policy across the departments. Secondly, government should prioritize smart net zero compatible infrastructure digitally enabled low carbon solutions that improve delivery, use, and the commissioning should be required for all infrastructure that receives public funding. And government should also invest in the data and digital systems needed to inform and support low carbon activity, including in the areas of transport, resource use, the built environment, and land use. Thirdly, digital skills and capabilities should be strengthened so that businesses and communities across the country can benefit. Targeted business support should be provided through a national program for digital adoption with explicit prioritization of low carbon and resource efficiency. And this should be complemented by skills program to jointly support the growth of clean industries and digitalization. The fourth recommendation highlights the need to bring people along in the transition by addressing privacy and safety concerns and ensuring that data is used for public goods, which includes taking into account what different groups in society need in order to benefit for digital adoption from digital technologies. And finally, with smart devices and demand for data and digital services expected to grow exponentially, policy should also address their climate and resources footprint to ensure that as digital technologies are taken up, they do not contribute to further environmental degradation. Tackling this will require setting standards for energy and resource efficiency and investing in new business models and cleaner processes. To conclude, we now have the opportunity to create a more resilient and prosperous economy. And it's by taking a joined up approach to digitalization and clean growth that the government can enable UK businesses to invest in the solution of the future and provide a resilient route to recovery that benefits people, people and nature. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to the minister's opening address and to the panel discussion. Thanks, Katerina. Let's turn to the minister. Anyway, yeah, thank you all very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the Green Alliance for this opportunity and the invitation to discuss how we can uh, really focus our minds on digital and environmental priorities in the UK's economic recovery. I want to start uh, by making it very clear that the government uh, throughout this whole crisis um, remains very committed uh, to tackling climate change and not only uh, to tackling climate change, but also uh, to deliver um, on economic uh, prosperity, to deliver economic prosperity for all parts of our society. The one thing I always say is that um, we can actually combine a much, much more um, sensitive and aggressive approach against climate change with economic opportunity. For many years, uh, these two uh, goals were, were, were pitted against each other. And I, I don't think that that's the case. In fact, uh, in the last 30 years in the UK, we've reduced emissions by 43%. And while we've managed to grow the economy by 75%. So these two things really can go economic growth and sustainability and climate, the fight against climate change can work together. The National Data Strategy published in September uh, this year recognizes uh, the potential for data to help solve uh, climate change problems and reduce the UK's carbon footprint. However, uh, the strategy emphasizes that the true impact of data uh, on sustainability is not fully understood. And, and that means that really we're at the beginnings of this uh, journey, if you like. Um, I think we're very much at the beginning of our understanding of how we can use data really in the fight against uh, climate change. So to gain greater insight into the relationship between data and the environment, the consultation on the framework uh, strategy uh, seeks views, a uh, wide range of views, perhaps on the role of government in ensuring that data does not negatively contribute to carbon usage. In an energy context, uh, digitalization is clearly a crucial element uh, in our decarbonization efforts. Um, our future energy system uh, will be increasingly integrated across multiple networks, including electricity, gas, CCUS, hydrogen, uh, and of course, uh, across the whole uh, transport spectrum. And I think digitalization will be absolutely crucial, essential 
to making sure that a complex system uh, of the kind that we envisage uh, can work effectively. Uh, Data-driven energy systems, I think, can optimize uh, the operation of the systems. They can certainly make uh, markets operate much more efficiently. And they can also help integrate uh, low carbon technologies onto the grid. Uh, and it's really through data that we can plan uh, more effectively uh, from a local point of view and also across the whole, the whole system. Uh, and in order to achieve that, um, we will obviously need uh, greatly to improve how uh, data is used across the energy sector as a whole. The Energy Data Task Force report, I think, has been a catalyst uh, for change in our um, attempt to understand how we can digitalize the energy system. Uh, since publication of the report, I think real progress has been made to implement uh, the task force's recommendations uh, through the Modernizing Energy Data Program. There is a great deal of activity across the sector, um, and it's really important that the enthusiasm uh, and the dynamism uh, is maintained that we can so that we can sustain the momentum which will ultimately help us reach the goals uh, that we've set ourselves. I think this work needs to be coordinated uh, to make sure that uh, outcomes uh, can be delivered. The government is absolutely committed uh, to the digitalization agenda and we all understand the crucial importance of data and digital technologies to achieve our net zero goals. We fully intend to gather and build on uh, feedback that we glean, uh, and we're also uh, actively involved um, in engaging with stakeholders about how best uh, to use data. I mean, for my part, um, I was uh, privileged enough to host a roundtable in July uh, to discuss the role the government should be playing in uh, really forging ahead with digitalization. This was part of a series of discussions uh, and the, the broad title that we set ourselves uh, in these discussions in July was uh, towards an integrated energy system. And of course, digitalization is a key part of any integrated uh, whole uh, solution in terms of energy. Net zero um, can be seen, and I think it is fundamentally a systems challenge. And to deliver real change, we need to look at uh, institutions and also governance uh, at the same time. The forthcoming energy white paper, I think, is an opportunity, will be an opportunity to set out our ambitions and direction of travel. And I've looked at uh, various drafts of the documents and we do talk um, about digitalization of our energy system. It's not prescriptive. It's not something that um, we can we can measure out uh, in, a, in a very kind of well-defined way, but it's absolutely something that uh, is on, near the top of our agenda. Looking towards the wider economy, um, the cross-government uh, smart, smart data review has concluded that there's considerable potential for data-driven services that can support better consumer outcomes across uh, a wide variety uh, of consumer markets. The next steps of this review um, were set out, I think, how we can bring consumers and um, small to medium-sized enterprises uh, in control of their data and actually empower them to use uh, smart data, because I think that's uh, one of the issues, one of the problems we've had is that when people talk about data, they don't think of it as they think of it as some big impersonal system operated by um, governments or, or people in authority. They don't think of data as something that they can use themselves, that can empower themselves and their, and, and their businesses. And I think that, that's a real challenge that we all have to bring it down to the people and bring it down to uh, small uh, and medium-sized enterprises. Finally, uh, the government will publish a new digital strategy this year uh, to drive growth in the digital sector and across the wider economy. Uh, and critical to all of that is, of course, uh, climate tech. Um, and we hope that we can, as we come out of the COVID uh, crisis, uh, that we can maximize the benefits of a digital-led economic recovery. The digital strategy um, will uh, set out a path uh, which can um, accelerate growth and build uh, a more inclusive, uh, competitive and innovative digital economy for the future. I think that, um, and I hope really in my opening remarks to give you a sense of the importance that the government attaches to using uh, digital technologies uh, for two things. There are twin challenges. There's the decarbonization challenge 
and of course the economic recovery. And as I've said earlier in my remarks, these two things really can go very well together. Um, we need to foster the right environment uh, for digital technologies to flourish. But also, um, more broadly, I'll finish on this. I'm always extremely interested in hearing from the industry what they would like to see more of. Um, this isn't something which government can simply drive itself. There has to be a dialogue between uh, the private sector and the government. There has to be a, a, a dialogue between individuals and, and larger organizations uh, with government uh, really sitting in the middle of that. I look forward to the debate. I'm very happy to be taking part uh, in the discussion. And I'm very interested to hear people's ideas about how we can really um, fulfill the potential of digital technologies uh, so that we can meet uh, uh, and undergo the transition uh, towards net zero. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Minister. We'll be joined now by our other panelists so, uh, for some opening comments. Kathy Peach is uh, co-head of the Centre for Collective Intelligent Design at the Innovation Foundation, Nesta, and Albert is head of global analysis at Bloomberg New Energy Finance, which provides re research on clean energy, digital industry, and a range of other markets. Um, Kathy, would you like to start? Thanks, Ros, and um, congratulations to uh, the, the team at the Green Alliance for putting together a really timely and really important report. Um, so at my team and Nesta, we've been exploring the question of how can we combine new digital technologies, particularly AI, and the collective intelligence of large groups of people to create new forms of community-led response to the climate crisis. And I'm just going to touch on one of the opportunities that we've been exploring recently through our civic AI project. Now that opportunity is to create a digital ecosystem to measure and model the environmental impact of our green urban infrastructure. And by that we mean things like trees, parks and allotments. Now it's really obvious, but trees are one of the best green technologies that we have. But we also know that lots of local authorities really struggle to maintain their green spaces and they struggle to justify the upfront investment in them. And one of the main reasons for that is the, the practical challenges of uh, providing or measuring the tangible benefits of things like trees and the lack of local and granular data. But we could now be measuring the benefits everywhere in the next few years using new digital technologies and working with communities. Let me just give you an example of how we could do that. So for example, we could be combining data from satellites monitoring canopy cover with uh, data from sensors in the ground measuring things like soil, water uh, and carbon sequestration. Combining those with data generated by citizens on things like the tree species in a local area. Then we can use machine learning algorithms to analyse that data and help us model and measure the impact that those trees are having on the local environment, whether that's helping with local cooling effects, with improving air quality, or things like uh, helping with flood mitigation. We can also use tools like agent-based models, which are a form of AI. We can use those to simulate the impact of alternative tree planting strategies or to simulate the impact of proposed housing developments. So we can use these new digital technologies to help us make better, more sustainable local planning decisions and also to develop new financial models for ecosystem services. Now the work that we've set out recently through our Civic AI project is really about what might be technologically possible within the next three to five years, but there's already lots of existing capability and existing appetite across the UK. For example, the Urban Observatory, which is based at Newcastle University, has the UK's largest publicly available urban open data system. Belfast City Council is in the process of trying to set up a citizen office of data analytics. So that's all about data driven innovation, but with citizens very much at the heart. And we've got a thriving citizen science community here in the UK. We've got millions of people who give up their free time to collect data, to analyse data for environmental and other scientific research. 
But if we want to make the most of digital technologies to uh, achieve the climate goals, we need three things. One, we need new funding mechanisms that are publicly owned because venture capital on its own won't get us there. Number two, we need new open frameworks, open data standards, governance, hardware protocols for public interest technology. Number three, we need to invest in building new forms of collaborative capacity and experimentation at the community level, really leveraging the expertise and the reach of our universities and our civil society organisations. And of course, we need to create these new technological and social infrastructures in partnership with local authorities and local communities. It can't just be top down. Great, thanks. Um, some really nice examples there too. Albert. Thank you, Roz, and um, th thank you very much for inviting me to, to join the panel today. Um, and congratulations to Green Alliance on this very good report uh, with some really important findings. Um, I'll just echo the minister and, and echo Katerina in saying, you know, clearly the 21st century economy is one that will be driven by these two mega trends that, that we're talking about, decarbonisation and digitalisation. Um, and, and very much agree with the minister that the, the push to net zero is both possible and economically achievable with um, while delivering long term growth and, and real business opportunity. And the, the digitalization piece of that is in the meantime being able to boost economic productivity um, and also bring the improvements in energy productivity in terms of reducing waste, increasing efficiency, increasing asset lifetimes and so on and so forth. And um, I think from, from the sort of clean energy perspective, it's really important to, to think about energy productivity as something we desperately need to work on if, if we're going to keep delivering growth on the road to net zero. Um, and I think that's where uh, one of the places where digitalization and, and decarbonization um, really do have to be, um, as Katarina says, more, more joined up as we go forward. Um, thinking about the, the global context and where the, uh, where the UK sits, I would say that um, clearly, we're not the only country that recognizes this opportunity. Uh, we know the EU is targeting both of those pillars of growth um, with the Green Deal and the digitalization strategy. Um, China now has a net zero target and clearly targets digital leadership globally through a variety of programs um, like its Internet Plus and, and Made in China 2025 and, and so on and so forth. Um, so we're not alone, but the good news is we're not doing too badly either. Um, at BNEF, uh, we recently published a, a national ranking of industrial digitalization strategies. Um, and the UK actually comes fourth behind South Korea, Germany, and Singapore. Um, so we're actually doing quite well. We have some particularly strong fundamentals, like our world-class universities, uh, strong intellectual property laws that allow businesses to profit from their inventions. Um, increasingly, we've got meaningful policy programs uh, like the AI sector deal and the digital strategy, as, as the minister mentioned, uh, targeting growth in these areas. But there are some, some, areas, some basic areas actually where we don't quite match up to the top countries. Uh, for example, um, our number of graduates with uh, inf information and communication technology degrees is a bit lower uh, than some places. Um, we actually spend less on R&D in this country than some others. Um, and we also perform a, li a little less well on infrastructure, um, things like our 4G and, and broadband con connectivity rates. And so I think there are some areas that we can work on um, and actually great to see the report highlight um, these questions around skills and, and infrastructure enablement as I think they're, they're very much areas of focus. Um, and then I think, you know, the, on the other side, the, the sort of net zero and decarbonization side, clearly we are, um, we have a great track record in the UK in terms of transitioning away from coal um, building up an offshore wind industry, um, and we're we're genuinely, I think we're genuinely world leading in these areas. Um, but I think we need to keep looking at where the next opportunity is, and I think where there's a, a bit of a risk of missing the boat is on is on the sort of mobility transition that's happening um, over the next decade um, around battery technologies, electric vehicles, smart connected vehicles, and so on. Um, at BNF, we're forecasting the EV market to grow tenfold in this decade. Um, and in this country, we, we do have a long-term goal to phase out internal combustion engines. Um, but in the meantime, with uh, the uncertainty and the challenges created by Brexit, for example, it's actually quite difficult um, for businesses to invest in the manufacturing capacity to build up these new industries. Um, so I think I recognize um, we're not here to talk about Brexit, but I think when we think about digitalization 
and decarbonisation and the frontiers of technology that we need to be uh, in the UK investing in. And it's really important that we have you know, the skills and the infrastructure and, of course, the favourable trading conditions as well uh, for companies to be able to invest. Great. Thank you very much, Albert. Um, lots of really interesting thoughts there. And um, yeah, I'm glad everyone seems to agree that there's, there's a real opportunity here. It's, it's a question of kind of capturing it and sustaining momentum. So um, it's on that on that basis, um, one thing I wanted to ask was which sectors so far seem to be uh, sort of further ahead and which can we look to for examples of, um, of what can be done? This, uh, I don't know if there's anyone particularly, whether Albert, do you want to pick that one up? Uh, yeah, I'd lo love to have a, a first go at that, Roz. Um, so, so we look globally at this picture, right? You know, which sectors are, are digitalizing fastest, and and globally we see that it's really the manufacturing industries and the power sector that seem to have the most momentum. Um, both of these sectors are um, uh, industries which historically saw rapid growth as economies grew, and then started to flatten, and the, the emphasis started to move from growth more towards efficiency and streamlining and being more competitive and more efficient. And that's really driven this, this need to digitalize, to reduce costs, to extract more value out of every, every unit of input, whether it's energy or, or materials. Um, I think as it, as it relates to decarbonization and, and you know, my, my own interests, I think the power sector has been where we've seen the most innovation and the most kind of interesting applications, um, whether it's you know, virtual power plant companies, for example, um, companies that are networking together distributed energy assets, um, you mentioned um, smart electric vehicle charging and so on and so forth. And I, I do think, I think that the enablers there have been, it's, it's interesting to think about what's, what's made that possible. I do think that, you know, we, we have a strong track record of, uh, record of turning out highly skilled workers who have the skills to develop these kinds of technologies. I think that um, in the power sector in particular, um, the process of opening up that industry to new entrants to competition has been really critical. I think we've seen that it's not always been the incumbents that have driven innovation. It's sometimes been some, some entrepreneurs coming in with new approaches. Um, there's been funding. Um, I think sometimes, you, you know, you, you do need um, in the power sector, whether it's the low carbon networks fund 10 years ago or the network innovation competition that just puts that little bit of public money behind um, these projects that can spark new technologies. Um, and then finally, I think very fundamentally, a really strong decarbonization agenda in and of itself um, that really drives innovation. So I think once you define the problem really clearly, in this case, carbon pollution, um, if you have a very clear terms of reference, then what you'll see is entrepreneurs come in and apply new technologies to the problem that's been well defined. Great. Thank you. Um, I don't know if either other speakers wants to contribute on that. Otherwise, um, on that just kind of continuing the theme of of a uh, kind of initial wins maybe i'd be really interested on a more personal level which opportunities and technologies you think are particularly exciting at the moment um and could really deliver great value um so yes yeah, any examples kathy would you like to start on that one yeah sure i think one of the things i'm i'm most excited about are the possibilities uh, from ai and machine learning um so, and I think what particularly excites me is how we might use those to help us make smarter and collective climate action together. And um, so let me explain, you know, as, as individuals and communities, we are obviously constantly confronted with decisions and actions that affect our carbon footprint, but we often lack the data and knowledge that enables us to know which ones will have the greatest impact. And in our communities, of course, there are going to be a diverse set of perspectives about the trade-offs that we are prepared to make. But what we can do is use now new AI tools and digital technologies to support new forms of collective deliberation to help us achieve and agree kind of common shared priorities. And I think we can also start to use agent-based models to help us simulate the impacts of both our own personal behaviours and our collective behaviours uh, so that we can understand the different contributions that they make. And we can also use machines now to create new forms of collective accountability, holding each other accountable for more positive climate actions. I think this is one of the areas that hasn't been particularly invested in to date. I think it's an area with really unexplored potential and I really hope that this will be an area that the government looks at a bit more closely 
over the next few years. Minister, is there anything in what you've heard so far or in the, you've come across from talking to people in your stakeholder engagement that you think? Is no, I think there's a lot of opportunities. I mean, what I would say is that um, people have talked um, AI and the possibilities of it uh, <clears throat> very greatly. And I think that's you know, a big opportunity. I think we need to get <clears throat> be a bit more specific, forgive me, about um, how AI can really deliver what we, we want. Uh, because all the discussions I've had about AI have been very, very general. <laughs> Um, and there's been a lot of sort of optimism and the kind of general wave of, um, you know, wonder and possibility. But I think, you know, we need to think about exactly how, um, you know, AI can actually drive what, what we want. Intuitively, it makes sense. I mean, why wouldn't it be very useful? But I think there needs to be a bit more granular thought about exactly how we can uh, deploy this um, potentially formidable uh, technology uh, to, to drive change in, in the sector. Great, thanks. I, I think that's a useful challenge to all of us actually to keep talking about examples and real opportunities and, and not talking generalities, which I think is, is potentially quite easy when you're talking about some of this. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, oh, sorry, go on. <laughs> carry on, carry on. Agreeing with what you just said. Okay. Um, Albert, did you want to come in on that or and then uh, yeah, Kathy? I, I could give a quick example um, that we're so at, at BNEF we spend a lot of time thinking about the energy transition but increasingly we're thinking about agriculture and food as well because it's a huge part of the climate challenge clearly um, around the world and um, ju just starting to see more applications of digitalization and, and AI for, for example in precision agriculture where the idea is you take real-time data from drones and satellites and you can apply your your nutrients or your your, your seed or your 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 um, you know other inputs in a, in a very targeted way for example in, in just the corner of the field where it's needed which which reduces costs and re reduces uh, nutrient runoff and reduces carbon emissions and so on. Um, another, another interesting one that I, I think is such a such a hard problem is um, is food waste, where globally I think the number is about about a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions come from the from the food and land sector globally. I think it's a bit less in the UK, um, and a third of food goes to waste. So so it's just a staggering problem where there's enough food being produced globally to feed everyone. And the challenge is that supply and demand aren't linked up. And, and with food, the, the linkage between supply and demand needs to be really rapid because food goes off, right? So, so for me, there's, there's this clearly huge challenge in front of us that if we just had better, um, better linkage, better intelligence, that, ha that right from the, from, the, from the farm and the field all the way down to the, the people and the specific locations where that food is needed, even within one country, let, let alone globally, um, you might be able to start to chip away at that at that thirty percent of food that that gets um that gets chopped away, and um, so I think I think probably everywhere we look there's challenges like that, but maybe it's a case of trying to bring those up to light so that we can all kind of focus on challenges that AI and digitalization can help to solve. Could I come in on that point? It's a really really good point, um, and I just want to issue a little bit of a corrective. I I totally agree with Albert that information will help us um, deal with the problem. But we can't assume that just because it, it, this wastage of food is through lack of information. You know, there may be lots of other reasons why the food isn't being distributed or why people feel it's more economical to, to just throw it away than to get it to people who need it. It's not, I don't think it's just a lack of information. If somehow we had more information and we knew where these people were, the food would get to them. That's all I want to say. Sure. No, that's, that's fine. Thanks. Um, Kathy. I think you want to um, say I just wanted to say, you know, I think there are lots of tangible examples of how AI could be used. Um, I've just put in the chat, I hope you can see it, a link to our recently published toolkit on Civic AI, which sets out three tangible opportunities uh, with blueprints that set out the uh, technology and the infrastructure that would be needed to realise uh, these opportunities. There's also a group called Climate AI who set out the potential applications of machine learning uh, for climate change in a whole range of different domains. So there are tangibles out there uh, and I'd really urge um, the minister's team to, to explore those. Great, thank you. Computer stuck on mute there for a minute, but the technology not not complying. Um, great, and also I see some people have put some examples actually in of um, opportunities in the, the chat. I'm not sure if you've made those available to everyone or just the panelists. So um, yeah, be careful when you're posting in the chat so that everyone can see. Yeah, um, and it's it's a really good challenge to kind of perhaps talk big and uh, and, and big scale and grand um, ambition, but also bring in those examples at the same time. 
Um, I was going to move on to something else now, which is um, the topic of kind of keeping the public on board. Um, the minister mentioned SMEs, and, and I'd be interested in that too. But but also, how do we get uh, the public engaged in some of these technologies and um, get over concerns around privacy and, and those kinds of things? Um, I don't know, uh, Minister, did you want to start on that or? Thank you. I think that's a really interesting uh, place to start. I mean, one of the things I've found, certainly in, in politics, is that, um, you know, certainly as an energy minister, there's a, there's a big difference between uh, people like ourselves who are engaged with these issues on a daily basis. And, you know, normal people have a defined uh, going about their, their ordinary uh, day, daily business and, and their, their lives. And trying to um, bring these two things together is, is actually quite difficult. Um, and I think that when you talk about data and you talk about AI and you talk about robotics, a large portion of the public just switches off because it seems really ab abstract. They think of uh, men and women in white coats. They think of, you know, crazy physics lessons that they rather didn't, uh, hadn't been, been to. And, it, and, it's, and it's very, very remote. And what we've got to do, and I'm very pleased that Kathy's mentioned this, is we've always got relentlessly to talk about practical applications. And, and how you know people can benefit from uh, from uh, a practical sort of science, if you like. So one illustration of this is you know satellite TV. Some of us are old enough to remember when we just had three or four channels or whatever it was, and then we had satellite TV. But we didn't know how satellites worked, but we just enjoyed the fact that there were lots of different channels. Um, so I think bringing that kind of science and technology uh, to you know people like ourselves in normal life um, and our parents and our friends and people who aren't engaged with this world all the time, I think is one of the big challenges. Thank you. Um, yes, I'll let Kathy come in and then I think we'll turn to Libby and get some of the questions from the audience. Yeah, we actually did a piece of research looking into this last year and what we found was that the public uh, wanted innovation that promoted the social good as well as helped to strengthen the economy they wanted innovation that made the population healthier, safer, uh, and that also tackled the root causes of climate change. And they wanted innovation that benefited more people and more places. But one of the things that really stood out was that of, of all the people we involved in the research, only 18% said that they felt that people like them had any influence or power over innovation or research and development spending. So I think if we want to get the public on board, we need to make sure that we are also investing our R&D spend in the issues that matter to them. We need to be more transparent in how those funding decisions are made. But the really big opportunity is to use new digital technologies to involve the public in deliberating about the type of future that we want and to, you know, and agree you know what our collective priorities are what the role of innovation and emerging tech in meeting those priorities is you know there are lots of platforms tools like polis which uses ai for example it's used by the government of taiwan to involve their citizens in quite complex policy debates but we're also a world leader in immersive technology and we could be doing what you know hamburg and helsinki are doing and using technologies like augmented reality to bring together citizens and local authorities to make decisions together about urban planning or, for example, housing for refugees. But to bring the public on board, the thing I've two things to emphasize quickly, you know, we don't need to resort to the really tried and tested old public engagement methods of town hall meetings and surveys. And it doesn't just need to be about citizens assemblies either. So again, last year, we published a report called Our Futures, where we set out some practical methods for involving the public in conversations about the futures, about the future using digital technologies and tapping into techniques from art, design and culture. And I think second key point, public, getting the public on board shouldn't be an optional extra because getting the public on board is critical to the social adoption of new technologies it's really important for building trust in emerging tech. And it's also important, you know, we know we've got a problem with uh, technology being designed by a very small elite narrow group of people by involving people, a wider group of people earlier on in the design and testing of technologies. We can also ensure that we are avoiding 
uh, any blind spots and potentially terrible unintended consequences. Great, thank you. With um, Let's broaden out the conversation on that note, um, as somewhat in the lines you were suggesting. Um, Libby, have you got, um, I don't know which questions you wanted to put forward. Um, I'm going to suggest that um, respondents answer as briefly as possible so we can get through a few questions. Thanks, Charles. Yes, we've had uh, quite a few questions coming in about digital twins joining up the low carbon and uh, <clears throat> economic agendas, strengthening local government, imported carbon, and uh, on the need for new institutions. So there's an, a bit of an advance warning there for the panelists to get their thoughts together on those matters. But in the first instance, I'm going to ask one of the questions that came in in advance, which, uh, which Albert has touched on already, which is on the need to ensure that we have the right skills to deliver on the agenda. And I wonder if, in the first instance, the minister might uh, might explain how the how the government is going to make sure that we have the skills needed. I think um, I think it's a very fair question, and in many instances, the education um, system is sort of lagging behind the speed of technological development. But on two things, I'd say you know I think the introduction of uh, T levels um, is, is is significant. I think you know we've got to think of a much wider approach uh, to education. And the other thing is um, when people are in the workforce, we, we are looking at um, having sort of green jobs, uh, kind of skills, you know, working group to see how, you know, we can marry um, apprenticeships, traditional apprenticeships with green technologies. This is absolutely something which we're focused on. Great. Thanks. I think we'll go to Libby for another question. Okay, um, one of the top questions that, that's been voted on, and a reminder to all of the audience members that you can upvote any question that you want to see answered, but uh, quite a popular one is, is there a need for new institutions to focus on supporting green di digital technologies? And, and the questioner gave the example of industry and policy groups calling for an, an international center for AI, energy and climate to address barriers such as data access and quality financing and research business policy coordination. Um, I think that's a question, an open question that, that anyone could take, but perhaps Albert first. Um, I can't claim to have th thought about that particular question in much detail, but what, what I would say, I suppose, is um, just, just to sort of re reiterate a little bit what I was saying before, I think areas where we've seen kind of rapid innovation and in applying digital technologies to, to, the, to the climate challenge have been places where there's been um, a, a really clear mandate to get the job done on decarbonisation. Um, and, and a sort of competitive playing field to allow companies to really try and propose new solutions and often a, a, a little bit of a focus from the government in terms of bringing players together and providing a bit of seed funding to get things going. So in that direction, I suppose it, um, what, what you propose isn't, isn't, isn't a terrible idea. Great. I just wondered whether the Minister had anything to say on that suggestion as well. Obviously, this is a really challenging cross-cutting kind of challenge. I don't want to um, hog the answers, but institutions obviously have to mirror the uh, circumstances in which you know we find ourselves and then all i would say about this is that many of the institutions that we're dealing with i deal with as an energy minister were created you know 20 30 40 years ago um, and we we have to evolve those institutions and maybe it may well be we have to create new ones to um you know keep pace with with what's actually happening now great thanks kathy was there did you want to add anything on that one yeah, I think I would agree. There is a need for new institutions. I think there's also a need for um, anticipatory regulations. So I think we need to you know, think about how we do regulation differently. I know this is something that the team of, at Bayes are already thinking of and working on. And I think we also need to find new ways of enabling community-led experimentation. So it needs to be a combination of top-down regulation and also bottom-up experimentation. Great, thanks. Libby, next one. So we had another question that came in in advance, which was about the impact of the technology itself, um, that digital technology comes with its own carbon footprint, which the minister has ad addressed or, or mentioned already. So I, I'll expand this out uh, into my own area of interest because it also has obviously its own massive resource impact and, and there's a need to ensure that we're using resources to um, the, the resources that are needed for these technologies in the wisest way. So what does the panel think in general is, is the answer to ensuring that the, the footprint, both carbon and resource for these technologies is minimized as far as possible? Great. Um, Albert, did you want to... Have you yeah, I can take a quick stab at it. I think um, 
In terms of this, the, the carbon footprint of technology infrastructure itself, I think clearly it needs to, needs to be addressed, but I think there's a lot of, um, a, a lot of momentum already among um, major technology companies um, who operate data centers and telecoms networks and so on to, to, to run their operations off renewables. And I think um, that, that's gonna clearly be a trend. I mean, the faster we go on that, the better. Um, I think an interesting se second case is where digital technologies um, reduce the cost of a service, but in so doing, um, make it more accessible and therefore more people use it. So, so a good example is ride hailing networks, right? We, we, we want to have low carbon transport, but in reality, a lot of the ride hailing networks um, ended up pulling people off public transport and into cars and not the opposite. Um, and so I think in those cases, we need to take a look at that and say, okay, we, we don't want to stop these firms from innovating. They're lowering the cost of mobility, which is great. But then we just need to make sure that we're addressing the, 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 the effect of that. So in this case, probably trying to get them to adopt electric vehicles faster um, is, is the answer. But I think we need to be really eagle-eyed about those cases where digitalization is, is, is actually um, you know, raising emissions in, in some un unforeseen way. Great. No, I think that's a really good example there. Um, I think let's, Libby, have we got time for one more question? Um, um, we can take the most upvoted question, um, which is about the potential for the fourth industrial revolution in areas such as healthcare being recognised, um, but a suggestion that it's not yet focused on AI to the energy sector and a question directed at the Minister. Does the Minister believe that an enhanced focus on AI for energy would be useful, creating jobs, increasing productivity and reducing carbon? So the broad answer to the question is yes, but I'd like to see um, more specific applications. I mean, Cathy says that there are lots of them. Um, in my space, in terms of energy, I haven't seen that many, um, but uh, I'm sure you know she and her colleagues and others will disabuse me of that and say there are lots of opportunities. So I'm very happy to enter into that discussion. Thanks, Minister. Um, Kathy Albert, did you want to come back? Say anything on that topic? Okay. Oh, Kathy. Yeah, I think there are many opportunities. I'm happy to share um, details with um, the Minister's team. Um, I, yes, I think this is an area for more investment. Um, would be great to see that featured strongly in the industrial strategy. Uh, we do also need to make sure that uh, any investment in AI for climate also needs to go hand in hand with requirements for AI uh, companies to be really make much more concerted efforts, I think, to improve their energy efficiency. There are people in the AI community who are really concerned about the carbon impact on uh, big um, big data machine you know, learning models, uh, but actually that debate is not being had as much as it needs to be. So I do think there should all equally be requirements uh, on the community to, to address some of those issues. Great, thank you. It's pretty much getting to time to uh, wrap up. So um, just to ask all the panelists if they have any final comments. Um, Minister, can we start with you? I'd like to th forgive me. I'd like to thank everyone for taking part. It's really a uh, stimulating and interesting discussion. And I think for me, um, I'd really take up uh, Cathy's challenge on AI. I'd really like to hear more about it. I think uh, hopefully my officials will get in touch with you and we can have a, a discussion about AI specifically um, in the energy sector, because I think that's a, a really interesting, a really interesting area of, of conversation. So thank you very much. Lots of things that I've learned, um, and I look forward to engaging with you all um, in the not too distant future. So thanks. Well, thank you for joining us, um, Albert. Um, not, nothing much to add from my side. I think this, um, as we've discussed over the last um, almost an hour, I think this is a really, really important sector, really important area to get right, and. The ability to join up these two these two trends on digitalization decarbonization I, I think there's there's more to be discussed in in the coming months and years i look forward to to working with you all on that great and kathy i think um you know we've got a real opportunity here to make the uk a world leader in you know, citizen enabled digital ecosystems for the environment and we can use these new technologies to really augment civic agency, increase civic participation, uh, we can use it to overcome some of the current challenges of, of getting the public to agree priorities for climate action. Uh, and I think using these tools, uh, will, if we use them in this way, then we will also help 
strengthen our democracy and start to rebuild trust in, in some of our institutions too. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, thanks, to, thanks to all our panellists and thank you all um, for joining us today. Please do have a read of the report and uh, if you see anything really interesting, let us know and um, do, do keep kind of highlighting if you're involved in technologies, please do keep highlighting those and, and flagging those and the opportunities there as well. Um, hopefully this is just the start of capitalising on all of these opportunities. Uh, a recording of this will also be available, this, uh, this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel, but I'd just like to thank finally once again all of our speakers and um, wish you all an enjoyable rest of the day. Bye.